on the edges, a couple filtering in there. Great turnout tonight. So first of all, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Kent State University of Stark. My name is Greg Smith. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Biological Sciences. And so along with my colleague, Mr. Robert Hamilton, who's running around somewhere, we want to welcome you here to our campus. Thank you very much for coming. A couple of things that I want to say for any students that need sort of documentation that you appeared here tonight, feel free to see myself or Dr. Hamilton, or maybe even come talk to Dr. Beck after his talk and meet him. So we, there's also food out there, and especially for students, when we're done, take it, all of them. So just take whatever you want and finish it off tonight, cooking and vegetables. There's a, there's a lot of vegetables left, but I'll take it. So I do want to thank a couple of people real quick. Just a couple of things we're doing tonight. We actually are on Facebook Live. So I want to thank Mike and Rich for setting that up. Uh, so that's kind of neat. So let's keep the profanity to a low level as we're on Facebook Live. Uh, also, Josh Isley in the back is videoing this. So for those of you that are teaching classes in environmental science, environmental biology, it will be available on our YouTube channel You know, within a few days after the talk, whenever we can get around to putting that together. So be looking for that as well. I want to thank Julie Spots and Melissa Seaton who did the advertising for this event and it resulted in this great turnout. So thank you very much for coming. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. Michael Beck. Dr. Beck is a research professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So he, for a couple of decades now, has focused his career on understanding coastal systems and coastal resilience, and how natural ecosystems can lessen the damage from large storms, storm surge, and so forth. And so Dr. Beck is going to talk to you about some really incredible, exciting work that they're doing where they're actually quantifying the economic benefits of natural systems, things we call ecosystem services. And so I think we're thrilled to have Dr. Beck with us. And I want to finally, before I introduce him, definitely thank the Herbert W. Hoover Foundation. So the foundation provided the funding to bring Dr. Beck here, provided the food and the advertising for the event and so forth. So I definitely want to thank the foundation for all of their efforts in allowing us to have this great conservation talk. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Mike Beck and welcome him, please. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate uh, your attendance. I really appreciate the invite and the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, Greg and uh, those folks here have been a, a great host, so I uh, really appreciate the, the opportunity. Okay, so as Greg said, what I'm going to talk about are the risks that we're facing, the risks that we're facing from natural hazards and climate change. And those risks are go growing, and there's a real need for solutions, and decision makers are seeking those. And there's interest in the role that natural habitats like coral reefs and mangroves can play in that. And if we can show that they provide those benefits, there's real opportunities to fund the needed conservation and restoration. But if we're going to get there, we've got to be able to rigorously quantify the benefits provided by these habitats. The good news is, I think I can show you tonight that we can do that um, uh, and help lead to a lot more conservation and restoration that's needed uh, uh, all around us. Okay, uh, I also want to thank uh, the Hoover Foundation uh, for the opportunity to speak here uh, and for the support of some of the research uh, that I'll be pointing to. I want to get to know the audience uh, for a second. So, uh, how many folks have been diving or snorkeling on a coral reef? Uh, that's actually better than I thought. Okay, tromping in a mangrove forest. Also better than I thought. Okay, uh, through a bad storm. <laughs> Really? Only that many? All right, we're going to start there anyway. All right, a lot of the reason why uh, I'm doing this work uh, is that coastal hazards are real and they're rising and we're looking for solutions for that. This gives an idea of some of the storm tracks over recent decades just in the area there uh, on the, along the eastern seaboard. Of course, um, uh, that's only part of the history. Uh, this is uh, all of the storm tracks from 1840 on. Uh, again, pretty serious set of storms, and those are growing um, uh, a little in frequency and definitely in intensity. 
Uh, and again, this is only part of the global problem. Uh, these are the global storm tracks uh, across all of the oceans. And uh, you know, if we thought things were bad here around the Atlantic, uh, well, uh, they're really bad there uh, in the Western Pacific. Um, I, I know a little bit about this, uh, even from my, my own experiences. Uh, so my great-grandfather bought a small piece of property uh, in the Bahamas uh, in the 60s. And so we're fortunate enough to have a little house in the woods there. Uh, this is uh, the track from Hurricane Irene uh, back in 2011. Uh, so uh, our house is right about here, right, under, right underneath the, the eye of that storm. Uh, and the next year, um, uh, Sandy, totally different direction, but yet again, uh, we're right underneath uh, the eye of that storm. Uh, and uh, even just a couple of years ago during Maria, this is a little Quonset hut that I uh, sat under, hoping that the waves would somehow get below 25 feet uh, so I could get out to surf. Um, uh, they never did, and I thought, uh, you know, if I failed, there was nobody on the beach, I'd end up in the Turks and Caicos, uh, so uh, I didn't go out. Okay, that's the, the, the kind of personal side of this, but if we look at the business case for this, we also know that risks are rising. Uh, this is data from Munich Re, the, the world's largest reinsurer. Uh, that's a business that insures the insurers. The fact that we need that already tells you something. Um, these are the, the uh, payouts from insurance over the years. These are the rest of the costs. Who bears the rest of the costs? We bear the rest of the costs. <coughs> All right, um, uh, uh, just a little bit about uh, reefs and how they work. Um, uh, healthy reefs provide many benefits. Uh, this, uh, you can see tourism benefits, fish benefits. They're also providing coastal protection benefits. What they do, and I'm going to show you this much more comprehensively, some of the math behind it, but they break waves. This is why people surf around coral reefs. It's because you're standing on a beach that has very little waves lapping up against it, and you're looking offshore at all the services that reef is providing by breaking all of that wave energy offshore so it's not coming onshore and flooding you. And we showed in earlier work uh, that they can break 97% of a wave's energy. Um, those are providing real benefits to you. And it's not just flood protection benefits, it's also erosion benefits as well. This is what's happening all along the Mesoamerican reef coast. That's the area from Cancun um, uh, on down towards Belize. And we're seeing all kinds of beach chairs hanging off of the edge of escarpments. Folks think, oh, that might be sea level rise. Actually, no. Most of that is because the reef is getting degraded offshore. More wave energy is pushing in, eroding that sand away, and creating problems across thousands of kilometers of coastline, or in that case, hundreds of kilometers of, of coastline. So real problems. This is a video of a mangrove in a flume. So this is a, an idea of how mangroves work. So mangroves are saltwater trees. Um, uh, they grow on tropical coasts. They essentially replace salt marshes. So we're used to say salt marshes on the east coast of the U.S. here. Um, uh, mangroves uh, start to take over that habitat around mid-Florida uh, and then south of there. And what they do is they break waves and they hold back the surge so that very little of that is transmitted through the forest and you don't see that flooding the land. So, Hopefully this gives you some idea uh, uh, of how that works. Uh, I will sometimes be contrasting this to gray infrastructure. Uh, so gray infrastructure as opposed to natural or green infrastructure. So the reefs and the mangroves uh, are green or natural infrastructure. Uh, this is gray infrastructure, what we're building on coastlines all around the world. Um, revetments, seawalls, uh, dikes, all kinds of barriers like that. Uh, to protect us from these natural hazards uh, which are growing. And so um, uh, either we're going to start doing a better job protecting our habitats and that first line of defense, or we're going to be investing in some very costly solutions. Okay, a lot of the reason why I got into this work about 10 years ago uh, is ultimately explained by, by this graphic. So this is a paper I put together with a graduate student uh, a few years back. And we wanted to understand what kind of funds were spent on gray 
versus green infrastructure. And this gives an idea of that kind of spending. So we first went and identified well, what could we find in budgets around the world that was being spent on habitat restoration, restoring those habitats. And uh, it was a few billion dollars uh, over that decade. You compare that to just, for example, the payouts after storms. And almost all of those payouts after storms, whether private or public money, goes into building gray infrastructure. In the conservation world, we talk all the time about, wouldn't it be amazing if we could double the conservation budget? And yeah, that, that actually would be amazing. <laughs> but how about if we could change how some of this money is spent? If we could change just a little bit of that, we could make the case that we can protect ourselves with these natural habitats, um, uh, then we could open up a huge amount of new funding streams for investing in conservation and restoration. Because otherwise, this is what we typically spend as taxpayers after storms. So after Hurricane Sandy, there was around $50 billion uh, in public payout. I went searching to find how much of that that I thought ended up back into restoration of marshes that were providing a lot of protections. Um, uh, only about 1%, so that's what 1% of your pie uh, looks like uh, if, you're, if you're ordering up 1% pie um, somewhere. Not very much uh, is the answer. All right, so we said, well, how, how can we quantify these benefits in a way that is going to make a convincing case to engineers, insurers, and governments uh, around the world? And so I worked with some colleagues uh, at the World Bank, uh, and what we said is, well, if we're going to estimate these benefits, there's basically a five-step approach for doing that. Um, and if you were an engineer or an insurer, you would go, well, of course that's what we do. But if you're an ecologist, that's not often what we did. Um, so we aim to show some ecologists how we could do this kind of work comprehensively. And in order to do it, I'm going to really simplify this. You need to know something about how waves are created offshore. And there's a whole variety of data and models that help you understand those waves offshore. You then need to understand how they get modified as they come near shore, estimate um, how they go over these habitats, like reefs and mangroves, then figure out um, how that turns into flooding, and then do that across the entire storm frequency distribution. You want in 10-year storm, you want in 50-year storm, so that you estimate the damages across all of that. And here, I'm showing a little bit of an example of that. So this is, for example, a one in 10-year storm with your reefs and mangroves in place, and here's what the flooding line would look like. And then if you got rid of that habitat in your models and asked, well, how much more flooding would there be? Okay, so there's a new flooding line, the one in 10 year storm without the habitat. All the people and property between these two lines, between these two flood lines, represents the people and property receiving benefits from keeping those reefs and mangroves in place. That's exactly how your insurer models these risks, and that's exactly how we said folks should model these. Really simple, huh? No, not really. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through all of it. You just need to know uh, that we work together um, uh, with a whole bunch of really smart folks to figure out how to apply this to, to, to habitats around the world. And then we did that. We said, all right, now we know how to do this. Let's go try to do this for all of the coral reefs of the world. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about the, the case with and without reefs. And by without reefs, I'm not talking about the disappearance of reefs entirely. I'm talking about the kinds of problems that we're facing right now. So all around the world, the shallowest corals are bleaching. Um, uh, that's being caused by the warming of the waters around them. Uh, when they bleach, they die. Um, uh, the next storm destroys all those corals. And we're really quickly losing this topmost meter of protection. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying reef loss. And again, you can, you can well imagine, if I had built you a breakwater offshore, and then I told you that I was going to take three feet off of it, you would go, that's probably going to be a problem. Um, yeah, indeed, that's going to be a problem. So in, in order to do this then, we looked at all 70,000 kilometers of coral reef coastline around the world. Uh, that's across 60 different countries. 
Um, we do essentially these transects, virtual transects, assessing flooding as it goes from offshore uh, to onshore. This is uh, the uh, Mesoamerican coast, Mexico, Cancun, around here. Uh, we've got uh, lots of years of uh, wind, wave, surge, tide data offshore. Uh, we're then taking all of that flooding onshore. We repeat all of the models um, uh, for all of these transects across all the different storm types, the ones in 10 years, the one in 50 year. We do that with and without habitats, um, do all the math to try to figure out um, uh, exactly what those benefits of keeping those habitats in place look like. I'm going to show you uh, just about a two minute video clip. So we worked uh, with the folks uh, from the California Academy uh, and they as part of uh, one of their planetarium videos, they uh, put together one of our models uh, and show what it looks like so you get a feel for waves coming across the, the, the Here we uh, see reef. the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, the largest coral reef in the Atlantic Ocean. When Hurricane Dean struck Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula in 2007, the reef helped shield the shoreline. So this is Cancun near the north. Scientists created a computer simulation to understand this is the how this American works. Reef. Reefs dissipate waves' energy, reducing wave height. So these are the waves, it's actually what we're modeling, waves coming across the reef, how much the reef is holding back, and some of the areas between the reefs where those waves are coming through uh, and where that flooding is reaching shore. And so what that looks like spatially when we're doing these models is so, uh, this is an example, so Playa del Carmen uh, is just a little bit south of Cancun. Uh, this is the flooding for a one in 25 year <coughs> storm. Uh, that's here in blue, uh, that's with coral reefs. We then drop the reef by a meter, ask what happens if you lose uh, that topmost meter of reef. Um, we then rerun the models. This area in green is the additional areas that would get flooded if you lost those reefs in this kind of event. And so all of essentially the people and property underneath those green polygons represent the people receiving benefits right now, the people are probably receiving benefits now from keeping those reefs in place. All right, and then when we sum this up all over the globe, this is what we find for all of those coral reef line, uh, coastlines. So here we're looking uh, at the storm return period. Uh, this is the built capital damage in billions of dollars. Uh, this is what it looks like with reefs. So this is essentially our present risk. How much we're, uh, what these storms are likely to cost us, and then how much worse that will be if we lose just the topmost meter of reefs. And the short answer is, every year the costs of storms will double on those coastlines if we lose just that topmost meter of reef those reefs are providing incredible services and benefits to us uh, all around the world. And of course, with some climate change, uh, that's only going to get worse. Um, this is just considering the effects of sea level rise. So the, these are the same two curves I just showed you. Uh, again, with reefs at present, uh, one meter reef loss. And then if we have essentially one meter, about three feet of, of sea level rise, uh, essentially those costs are going to double again. Okay, that's scary, but really the thing that most scares me is that um, some of that three feet of sea level rise is actually going to take decades to happen. Okay, so we got a little bit of time to, to, to plan for that, try to get it right. A lot of the loss of reefs can happen in years, really quickly, and folks don't see it, so they don't realize it, don't realize that those services and benefits are being lost, don't realize that the beaches are being eroded um, uh, because of that loss, don't understand it unless we help to show them that these are the real things that we're losing when we lose those reefs. And as I said, we did this in a very spatially explicit way. So we can show you on the map, uh, and this was published uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, where are the hot spots where reefs are providing the greatest benefits to people and property? So in this case, we're showing the annual expected benefits per 20 kilometer of coastline 
all around the world. And you can see all of the different hotspots, including some in Florida, the Bahamas, uh, Cuba, Jamaica, Mexico. So we know where and can guide decision makers in where to invest in reef conservation and restoration in ways that will pay us all back. And working with the World Bank, we also put this in a way that could actually get incorporated into national economics. So what I'm showing you here is the annual expected benefits provided by reefs for just flood protection benefits. We're not even talking about tourism uh, or any of the other benefits from these reefs. Um, uh, some countries are receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in flood protection benefits alone every year. These are the things that we should get incorporated in some of our national economics, like our GDP, the gross domestic product. Right now, when we account for ecosystems, we only account for the things we take from those ecosystems, the timber or the fish that we harvest. These are values that we're trying to get incorporated into national economics, which are the values of leaving that habitat in place, the real values and benefits for leaving those habitats in place. Okay, I'm gonna uh, now switch over, uh, talk a little bit about this same kind of work, uh, but applied to mangroves uh, around the world. And this is just uh, a different conceptualization. We just finished a, a, a project valuing uh, all of the uh, mangroves for Jamaica, uh, but we've also done this globally. I'm gonna give you a sneak peek. Uh, of some results that are about to be published in two weeks, so you'll be the first people who actually see them live. Um, uh, but we follow the same approach. Uh, again, it's just a different way of looking at it. Understand offshore, uh, see how that those change as the waters come near shore, go over the habitats, what that turns into in terms of differences in flooding, and then you calculate the economic consequences. Again, uh, all, all of the same outline uh, through that. And here are, are some of the global results. Uh, so in this graphic, I'm not showing the economics, I'm showing the social impacts uh, across uh, 700,000 kilometers of mangrove coastline. So mangroves occur in more than 100 countries uh, around the world, uh, subtropical and tropical. Uh, and this is uh, the people flooded in millions with mangroves and about 25% more people will be flooded if we lose those mangroves on our coastlines uh, around the world. And that includes some very important coastlines in the US, which, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, this, again, is the same uh, uh, kind of map that I showed you for coral reefs around the world. So these are showing the hot spots all around the world uh, where mangroves are providing particularly important flood protection benefits. Uh, and again, we can value those uh, in millions of dollars every year. So your annual expected benefit provided by those reefs. And again, we can, we can look at those by countries. And you might be surprised to learn um, uh, that in terms of economic benefits, the US is number one in the world for the benefits that it receives from its mangroves. Um, uh, and again, these are benefits that you as taxpayers receive. Because um, otherwise, this $11 billion in damages every year is going to be transmitted to you in those recoveries. And so right now, um, uh, Florida in particular, uh, but also <coughs> Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, uh, and some other areas are receiving really important benefits from keeping those mangroves in place. And you can see some of the other countries uh, you know, some of the list of the people protected, again, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, Philippines, um, uh, a lot of countries where uh, that kind of protection uh, is really sorely needed. Um, uh, also, I should point out, and uh, we had done this uh, for the, the coral reef work as well, I'm also looking at the damages relative to the country's GDP. Because again, in a country like the U.S., for lots of storms, we can figure out how to respond. Um, uh, we often have the budget, uh, even if we don't necessarily want to pay that, um, uh, we at least have some ability to do that. In lots of countries, relative to their GDP, uh, you know, these storms in the Bahamas uh, the past year, extremely difficult uh, to respond. Uh, and so if you think about uh, the benefits that these countries are receiving 
relative to their GDP. That means um, uh, mangroves are incredibly important to people's lives and livelihoods uh, in those countries that often don't have uh, an easy ability to respond otherwise. So uh, particularly important there. I also uh, now want to show you a little uh, graphic that I put together, uh, or rather a, a science communications graduate student. Um, uh, I just got the version of this last night. Uh, so uh, your comments and feedback later will help us because we're putting this into some of the, the social media uh, that we're doing around this. And what she was, uh, what she's trying to point out is that um, uh, if we look at the scenarios without mangroves, um, uh, where we've got increasing storm surge and waves, that results in some $800 billion in losses every year. And a lot of that is to public infrastructure like airports, ports, uh, and the like that are in our lowest lying coastal areas. But fortunately, if we invest in mangrove conservation and restoration, we could save more than $65 billion every year just by keeping in place our existing mangroves and that's before the kind of investments uh, in their conservation, uh, in their restoration as well, building back those habitats that we've lost. Okay, up to this point, what I've showed you is that, well, we can, we can take the same kind of tools that engineers use, uh, model this flooding, do that globally to estimate the benefits provided by these habitats. But then we said, well, how are insurers doing this work? And so we went to, to Risk Management Solutions. We had support from Lloyd's of London, uh, went to Risk Management Solutions. They're one of the top two risk modeling firms globally. So you may not know it, but if you're paying flood insurance premiums or the like, they've likely been figured out by RMS uh, somewhere along the line. And we said, Hey, do you, do you include habitats in your models? Do, do you know what the effects of habitats would be, you know, what, what these consequences would be with and without habitats? Uh, I won't tell you a full answer, but I'll say the, the, the short answer was, huh, no clients ever asked us for that before. Um, so we said, hey, why, why don't we sit down and try to figure out if we can, we can do it together? Uh, and so what we did in the first instance is we said, can we work with you to understand how important marshes were during Hurricane Sandy um, uh, on the northeast coast. So this is the track of Hurricane Sandy. Um, these uh, are the existing marshes from Delaware Bay up through uh, New Jersey. And we said, well, uh, let's uh, model these benefits and the risks with those habitats in place, and then without those habitats. In their model, that's kind of, I'm going to show you what that sort of looks like and how their model runs. So you're basically going to see um, uh, water heights from offshore moving onshore into Delaware Bay. So these are the shorelines. So as the colors change, as it hits the shoreline, that's floodwaters going up uh, on the coast. And so in their model, um, uh, they do a very complex uh, two-dimensional model to estimate flooding as it comes on shore. Let me show, let's show it one more time. It's working. Uh, so uh, we did this throughout uh, the area affected by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and basically what we found uh, is that uh, marshes prevented $625 million in Hurricane Sandy alone. And then we did that for a bunch of storms, uh, and we found out that that's a 15% reduction overall, on average, people, properties behind mangroves benefiting every year. And these are the kinds of levels at which homeowners could expect premium reductions for keeping those marshes in place. So we were trying, we're trying to work with them on a variety of fronts to say, hey, in particular, in these priority areas, these deeper red areas, um, uh, marshes are providing really important benefits, and there's a really good economic reason in your insurance models for why we ought to be providing protections to that and incentives for, for people to do it. Uh, and some of this work uh, you know, was showing up in insurance journals, claims journals. I'm, I'm just a little ecologist. I, I had no idea that these journals even existed or that you know, uh, our work would, would, would end up in such things. So, 
Uh, in the past few years, a kind of a whole new world of opportunity has been open for where we might be able to find businesses that can use some of these results for informing how we can do this conservation and restoration. And with support from the Hoover Foundation, uh, we've been repeating some of this work with RMS again for mangroves in Florida during Hurricane Irma. Uh, and these are some of the benefits uh, provided by mangroves during Hurricane Irma. Overall, mangroves prevented $1.5 billion in Florida alone um, during Hurricane Irma. Really, really important uh, benefits. Overall, they work even better than marshes in preventing flooding. So 25% annual reductions in flood property damages. So really important benefits that they're providing. And here you see in blue where they're providing the most significant benefits. There's also areas where they're providing negative consequences. Um, can, can you imagine what those areas might be? It's actually where uh, Florida has allowed people to build in front of mangroves. Um, uh, so uh, these are, mangroves are doing their job. Storms are coming across. They're preventing floodwaters from reaching the properties behind. Um, now we build properties in front of those, so those floodwaters are now piling up uh, into their homes. Kind of what you would expect if, for example, you built in front of a seawall. Um, for sure. Um, uh, but somehow um, uh, we still do that. And we're going to be able to show that as well. So mangroves are really working. We can show where mangroves are providing really important benefits and what the consequences of some of our development choices uh, really are out there. And this is just a, a, a slightly higher resolution analysis so that we can uh, point to some of those areas where we're really seeing uh, some of the problems that we can only anticipate uh, will, will grow uh, over time. Okay, so now I've shown you that we really can quantify the benefits provided by these habitats. We can do that with the tools of engineering. Uh, we can do that with insurance companies. So now let's try to find some opportunities where we can really drive investment into the conservation and restoration of these habitats. And there's a variety of places and ways that we can do that. We're already kind of, as you can see, hard at work about getting nature incorporated into these industry risk models. Um, uh, so that's already happening. There's lots of places where we can look for private incentives as well. Changes on how we do insurance. And I'm going to show you a brief example uh, of that. Some of the most important things that we can do are to think about our recovery spending after these disasters. Because the fact of the matter is, as much as it's cost effective to invest ahead of storms, um, uh, we have to face the reality that most of our payouts on these coastlines, um, uh, most of what we're doing is after storms. So being able to direct that well is really important. Um, I worked for, for 20 years uh, as lead marine scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Um, uh, I have a lot of experience with disasters. Um, the first actions uh, we had to take after any kind of disaster, storm, oil spills, the like, are to stop really dumb things from happening. Um, uh, because there's a lot of really bad choices that people want to make right away. Um, trying to stop that first, and then trying to help people make decisions that we're really going to build resilience is really, really important. And so that was a, a, a big part of what we were trying to do. Uh, and then I think it's really important to start thinking about how we spend natural infrastructure money, uh, particularly those uh, administered by the Army Corps uh, and FEMA and, and the like. Uh, I also think that there's really important opportunities uh, with transportation budgets, uh, because on shorelines all around uh, the country uh, and the world, we're seeing a lot of erosion on those coastal roads. For a lot of island nations, those ring roads provide the lifeblood uh, for the whole nation. Most folks don't realize that with the loss of reefs and habitats, the erosion that we're seeing on those roads and what we're having to do to build up with revetments and the like has to do with the loss of those habitats. If we understand that, then we should be investing some of those transportation funds into those habitats. 
One of the, the, the really innovative things uh, I think uh, that we've done uh, with this work uh, was sold the very first insurance policy um, uh, just six months ago for the Mesoamerican Reef. Um, so we developed with Swiss Re, uh, Swiss Re is the world's second largest reinsurer, an insurance policy paid into by the hotels and the Mexican government, so the hotels south of Cancun and the Mexican government to recognize that their reefs were providing really significant value in protecting those hotels and the economy. And so if a storm damages the reef and causes some of the loss of that height, the insurance policy will pay out for the rebuilding of that reef. Um, and that's the first, first in the world insurance policy uh, on, a, on a natural habitat. And then we're trying to do something even more complicated uh, with Munich Re, uh, and that's figure out how we can invest in building resilience ahead of time. So invest in reef restoration up front based on the insurance savings over time. So that's kind of illustrated here. So there's this resilience investment, in this case, reef restoration or mangrove restoration. You're paying in up front based on the savings in insurance premiums that you're going to get over time. Uh, and so this is something we're working right now, um, uh, just finished developing it. Uh, we're working uh, with a hotel client in the Dominican Republic uh, to see if we can invest in restoring their reefs, offering these protections, selling this insurance policy, uh, something that could uh, really uh, take fire uh, around the world. So uh, I uh, uh, really appreciate all your, your time and attention. Uh, I hope to have convinced you uh, that we can really rigorously show that habitats reduce flooding and erosion, uh, that we can rigorously value those benefits, and that by being able to rigorously value those benefits, that we can drive all kinds of new investment opportunities to be able to invest in the conservation and restoration that's needed. Thank you. Developments, uh, you know, uh, what do we do to, to convince decision makers, uh, you know, uh, to change this? Well, it's, it's kind of funny. So when I when I was working with the the, the Nature Conservancy, um, the one thing that conservation groups, insurers, and the Tea Party all agreed on is that we should price risk correctly on our coastlines. So right now we're all underwriting the risk of people who live on these coastlines. Um, the cost of FEMA flood insurance, for example, ought to be much greater than it is. But after years, essentially since 1927, uh, when we put in place some of those protections, um, uh, we've allowed people to build in these places, and sometimes um, uh, very socially vulnerable people as well. So it's hard to just say, oh, we should jack up the prices right away because the actual cost of living on the coast is much higher uh, than folks really can stomach right now, but we've actually got to figure out a just way to increase and really price risk correctly so that we're making decisions based <coughs> on the real risks. Um, that's my kind of first chief answer. Um, uh, lots of folks want to see us do this, uh, and so it's just a matter of finding a just way uh, of, of making it happen. Let me, let me go on to another credit. We'll come on back. Um, oh, it might be along the same lines, but like, what is like, say, someone, ordinary person like me, what do I do to help, you know, get the word out there about the reef and stuff like that and make those like, you know, because I'm saying, hey, look, I don't have that much money. What am I going to do? So, yep. 
So, so, so there are a variety of things. You know, uh, I, I'm a coastal person, so I'm going to talk about the coast. But um, some of these same issues, and I know I work with lots of colleagues who work on uh, essentially riverine floodplains. So many of the areas around you can also use natural solutions, where we can help restore vegetation in these riverine floodplains, um, uh, and essentially create places for the river to go, um, uh, create wetlands that help soak up the floodwaters. So getting involved, I mean, even at a very personal level, um, uh, if it's locally, getting involved in floodplain restoration, however you do it, whether it's with mangroves uh, or reefs or otherwise, one very important way, uh, I think. Um, uh, paying some attention to these policies and floodplains, um, uh, you'd be surprised what a little bit of input uh, from citizens can do. Uh, and so at least being aware when these decisions are being made um, uh, is important. FEMA's going out right now and remapping all of the floodplains around the U.S. It's an extremely contentious process. Um, uh, being informed uh, about it uh, and helping them, because lots of people, uh, and to be very frank with you, lots of developers um, uh, uh, are going to want to be fighting uh, the new flood maps uh, and uh, putting voices behind the importance of getting this right for your own taxpayer dollars. Very important. I've heard about reseeding some of the bleached coral reefs. I think it was uh, the Great Barrier Reef that they were doing that. Is that something they can uh, be done with every reef? Uh, yeah, so there's a, um, fortunately up to this time, we haven't had to invest that much in reef restoration. Now the problem is we've got to learn really quickly how to do it well. Uh, and so there's a lot of pride. I would say uh, the, the reef restoration community is farther behind than any other coastal restoration community. We know how to restore mangroves actually very well. We're doing hundreds of thousands of hectares of mangrove restoration around the world. Some of that restoration even supported by, for example, the Red Cross, because they actually recognize the benefits in reducing social vulnerability and storm hazards. Um, for reefs, we're gonna have to be trying a, a, a bunch of things. So we're gonna have to be uh, figuring out how to grow uh, and reseed uh, with small corals. That actually works pretty well at a kind of local level. So there's actually hundreds of groups doing that kind of work, and that's really great. Um, scaling that up uh, is actually gonna be hard. And this is kind of one of the things where occasionally Conservation groups have to figure out how to let go of some things, um, uh, and frankly, um, uh, let businesses create some opportunities to do that, to help grow it to scale. Because, um, I mean, again, I come from a conservation background, um, uh, and actually from a very large group uh, who had the ability to scale up as much as anybody, and I still didn't think uh, we, had, we had enough uh, to scale up. So we're also suggesting, uh, you know, uh, that if you want to achieve these kinds of benefits, we're actually going to have to couple structural reef restoration with biological. And by structural, I mean you know using reef balls, which are kind of a uh, could be big cement blocks or something else that creates that height quickly. Because if you can create that height quickly, I can figure out a whole bunch of ways to pay for it, um, uh, and that includes with FEMA recovery money. Um, uh, so I didn't talk too much about that uh, in this talk, but we've got support now from FEMA to try to figure out how to direct the activities and some of that $100 billion in funding from the 2017 storms alone, how to direct that into reefs. Um, uh, build up that height quickly, then plant living corals on top of it, because a coral reef is just a limestone wall. It's a seawall with this thin living skin of beautiful living corals. So we got to get back the wall and then put those living corals on top of it. India, in India's eastern coast, Andhra, Orissa, Chittagong, so Kolkata will not get this place. But how much do you see if this, this kind of study has been done? Anything that we have to be any information at all? Yeah, well, uh, so one of, uh, one of the lead scientists uh, uh, on my team is uh, Siddharth Narayan. Uh, he's uh, Indian by ancestry, uh, you know, uh, over here in the States about 10 years. We've been looking at how we might uh, help inspire some of the conservation and restoration there. Right now, the Nature Conservancy mostly works inland uh, in India, and we don't have um, uh, too many good areas where we feel like we can help groups, uh, but we are trying to pay attention.
So, I mean, I think that you are uh, going to see a growth in these, uh, you know, they're often um, uh, referred to as buyback programs, uh, you know. Uh, and I think that you're, you're, you're going to see, we started to see uh, a little bit more of those uh, after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, there were kind of quite a few areas, uh, essentially, uh, in New Jersey and on the southern shores of, of Long Island after those storms, where essentially first responders were saying, we can't get into those areas. We can't help you, uh, and we can't provide the, the basic services that you're gonna need. This is not a viable place uh, where people are going to be able to continue to live in an environment where risks are increasing. So this is gonna happen in floodplains, um, uh, freshwater floodplains around you, uh, coastal floodplains. Um, those kinds of buyback uh, uh, needs and opportunities are going to be rising because um, uh, they're frankly one of the few tools that we really have available where we can help people and ourselves reduce those risks. Um, and again, it's not the prettiest of, of, of things, you know, how you have to uh, figure out how we're going to do this. Um, uh, but if you've got another option for reducing risk in those areas, I'm all ears. So we have one more question. Bhatti, I think, had a question. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, refinancing for the insurance companies. Uh, in your opinion, do you think from actuarial point of view that they have sufficient data to make viable uh, resilience insurance policies? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the short answer, because we're working with them on it, is yes. Um, uh, 
you know, you you would think that they've got incredible resources to estimate all of these risks. You might not be right. Um, uh, uh, they uh, have some ability to estimate those risks. They're looking for folks uh, who can help them with that. So if we can show scientifically defensible, peer-reviewed approaches for doing that, um, they're amenable to it. Um, uh, and they actually do see business opportunity in it. And I'm fine with that. Um, uh, if, if this creates opportunities for them to figure out uh, where they might help invest in these risk-reducing uh, approaches, great. Um, uh, and I know I'm working with all of the biggest reinsurers right now. All of them are interested. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm working with the folks, uh, you know, who are, uh, let's say, a little greener in those companies. And, you know, I've had to sit in Munich and uh, try to convince some uh, German executives, which uh, is not always the most comfortable position to be in, um, uh, that uh, we've got something for them. But they're listening. Ron, did you have a quick question? Yeah. Last one. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we are introducing more and more anthropogenic waste matter into our oceans and rivers. So since you are studying coral reefs, uh, my question to you is that as we increase more plastic waste or other type of floating debris, how are they impacting the coral reefs and subsequently the flood patterns? Are they impacting yep. the coral reef growth? Yeah, so you're, so you're asking uh, uh, about effects of pollution, plastic pollution uh, uh, on reef. Actually, if you don't mind, um, uh, where they're really having an impact um, uh, is on mangrove restoration. And I didn't realize this until we were just completing the report with the World Bank in Jamaica, and we were trying to get estimates uh, of the costs of mangrove restoration. And the costs were really high uh, in Jamaica. And, uh, so are you, are you guys sure? Like, why, why, why are these costs? Because we're trying to essentially do benefit cost analysis and figure out where you can uh, do these investments. Um, uh, and in the greater Kingston area, the amount of plastic trash essentially on the streets and in the coastal rivers um, uh, is flooding down. And every time they do a mangrove restoration, it's smothering all of the seedlings right there. So they have to invest in essentially trash fences to hold back the trash until the mangroves can get big enough. Um, uh, uh, first of all, th that was a first for me. Um, uh, but again, a very kind of real consequence uh, of that pollution. So once again, I want to thank you all very much for coming. This was a great turnout. Thank all of the folks here at Kent State that made this possible, including the food with our folks in the Emporium and Aramark. And I want to again thank the Herbert W. Hoover Foundation for funding this. And finally, thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Beck one more time for being here.